a new hero has been born, and another lost. One on the path of light, the other losing their way, as their path collides and their fate becomes intertwined. Can the fledgling hero become the light that rises against a growing darkness? Is that even the right choice to make? Welcome once again to my video series on the Korean MMORPG Mabanogi. Like in my previous two videos on the topic, I will be summarizing the events of Generation 2, then discussing the connections between the characters, lore, and mechanics of the game and mythology here in the real world. You can find a playlist containing my Mabanogi videos linked at the top right if you missed my previous entries. As always, you may want to consider enabling subtitles. Before we venture further into the video, I just want to give a brief disclaimer that this information may not be wholly accurate, as Mabinogi is a smoothie of Celtic myth. Irish, Welsh, and Scottish, with plenty of anime tropes as special sauce. I may end up conflating things or failing to find connections, so if I get anything wrong, please let me know so I can add it to a pinned comment. Also, this generation is extremely lore centric I feel like that deserves a disclaimer, in its own right, because fuck that guy. These next two generations are some of my least favorite, mostly because of him. With those warnings out of the way, let's talk about the plot. I also feel it's important to mention that my retelling of the generation stories is not one to one. There's a lot of busy work quests that don't actually advance the plot and sometimes poor writing makes plot twists extremely obvious. As such, I'll be omitting for brevity and better narrative experiences where I feel I need to. I'm also playing through as a giant. There are some racial differences for some quests, but the gist is generally the same. I'll put something up on screen when needed. Generation 2 begins with Morrigan calling out to the Milesian to follow in the steps of Luke, the Knight of Light, as she needs a true paladin to help her thwart the machinations of Cycle and his film wars. This task sends you to speak with Craig, a member of the Order of Paladins. A moment of silence, please, while we appreciate that Generation 1 sent us far to the frozen north of the continent to find a shape-shifting druid, and now we're set down the street to meet the local state farm agent. Craig gets done adjusting your auto insurance rates and then sends you to the local lord to get a recommendation to join the paladins. Once you return, Craig sends you to Barry Dungeon to train by clearing a kobold infestation. Like the unpaid intern, these generations are about to treat you like you go do Craig's dirty work, despite the other paladin trainees mentioning they think it's actually just the lord's advisor, Ezrus, wanting access to the gold within the mines. Upon entering the dungeon, you discover that one of the three lost heroes of Generation 1, Rory, is still alive, though weakened. He had fallen into a deep sleep for several years after the events of Generation 1, and was kept alive by the Dark Lord Borgant, and a small half foam war girl, Triona. The player then completes the dungeon, and returns to Craig. Craig sends the Milesian to yet another dungeon. Here, the player encounters Rory and Trina, fighting both. Rory is invincible, because plot armor, and defeats several trainees in the player single-handedly. Eventually, Ezrus and Craig show up, and Ezrus forces Rory to yield by threatening Trina. Ezrus attacks the girl anyway, and sends the paladins after Rory, but Morgant appears and saves the two. Shortly after this, presumably disgusted by being ordered to do some child murdering, the player decides to leave the paladin training and seek another path. The player begins searching for an ex-paladin, Redire, said to be an equal to Lu. The bard Neil points the Malaysian to Price, a traveling merchant who claims to have known Redire. Price tells the player that they too are looking for Redire, and according to Price, he had disappeared after being defeated by Morgant. Craig denies this, lecturing the player on State Farm's competitive rates. Speaking to Price once again, he tells the player to get a book from Dune Barton's bookstore. With the book in hand, the player sets out on an arduous quest of getting people dates. Once done playing matchmaker, the Malaysian seeks out the water spirit, Air. 
she is found south of Avonmaka on Keo Island, inside a small bunker thing. Because of your legendary exploits and matchmaking, she sends the player off to find out what other people find attractive, sending you to a few different towns for maximum time-wasting mileage. Once you report back, Neil, the bard from earlier, confesses his love to Air and sings a song for her while you third wheel very awkwardly. Once he's done, Air helps the player acquire a set of armor that must be taken to Kier Dungeon. Within the depths of Kier, the player is given a test. Taking on the shape of a bear, the Milesian is stripped of all items, stats, and most skills, and forced to make their way through the dungeon. A great spirit waits in the boss room, and once defeated, it binds itself into the player's service. With this, a true paladin is born, though still just a fledgling. New power in hand, the Milesian returns to Price. Price tasks the player with decrypting a set of letters he'd found, which he believes have a magical cipher placed on them. With a little effort, the two discover that Ezrus had previously had Trina kidnapped, causing the Fomors to invade Avonmaka, as well as a sinister potion crafted to help control the minds of others. Now concerned for the safety of the young Lord Rian, the Milesian rushes off to find Ezrus. Ultimately, the player is too late, and finds that Rian has been nothing more than a puppet for quite a while. With his corpse now functioning as a core for the ancient golem, Tortoise, Price and the Milesian try to destroy the golem, but are initially unsuccessful. Only once Price falls does the power of the paladin take hold within the Milesian fully, taking on a more bestial form. Now awakened, the Milesian is able to easily handle the golem and Ezrus. Rory enters the scene, and is outraged when he sees Rian's body. He asks who's responsible for his death, which Ezrus blames on the Milesian. Head empty as ever, Rory believes the obvious villain's obvious lie, and swears his revenge. But Price helps the Milesian escape, and the credits roll for Generation 2. Before we start talking about some of the real-world origins and some of the lore, I want to address some theories I've heard discussed about Rory in Generation 1. There is a theory floating around that Rory's soul was used in Glasgow Non because they claim all souls need bodies, and vice versa that all bodies need souls. This is probably drawn from what Dougal says about how messing with someone's soul can turn them into a zombie, and the fact that he himself is Gloss's soul that was forced to inhabit a human body. Trina also mentions that Morgant had to use magic to prevent Rory's soul from dying, and Cycle offhandedly mentions that the blood of someone as brave as the Milesian was used in his summoning. So I guess the conclusion isn't that crazy, but it's probably not correct. Gloss is purposely summoned without a soul so that it can be bound to the summoner's will and used like a puppet. The blood Cycle mentions is probably a reference to Mary, as we know she was later reincarnated as now. The blood is literal, and not referring to a soul. What's more plausible is that Morgant purposely injured Rory, instead of landing a fatal blow. We know that the Dark Lord is serving under Cycle solely to his own ends, so it makes sense that he'd want to fake Rory's death and take the boy under his wing if he saw the potential for Rory to become a Dark Knight. It's an explanation that fits Morgan's character much more, and accounts for Rory not instantly dying in the Dark Erg explosion Gloss let off when it died. With that out of the way, let's talk about paladins, tortoises' name, druids, and other cool things, starting with paladins, because the concept of a paladin is kind of the odd one out. Paladins aren't inspired from anything in Irish myth or any sort of Celtic belief. Paladin finds its root word in the Latin word palatinus. Far from meaning a magical divine knight, palatinus simply means belonging to a palace and was used for government officials and palace guards. By the time of the 13th century, Paladin had been used in French Romance literature to refer to Charlemagne's peers, or knights who were his closest companions. From this association, Paladin came to have a more extended meaning, and any heroic figure could be a Paladin. However, Mabinogi's depiction of the Paladin draws from a much more ancient source. Far, far in the ancient past, before time began, in the year of 1975, the Paladin class made its debut in the first edition of Dungeons and Dragons. Then, in Advanced Dungeons and Dragons First Edition, 
It appeared as one of the standard classes available in the player's handbook. The only race able to take the subclass? Humans. We see this directly paralleled in Mabinogi, as elves and giants are not able to become paladins, instead receiving a beast form. Who would have guessed that the kinds of nerds that make fantasy MMOs are the same kind of nerds who make tabletop games, right? This inspiration will become important again in Generation 3 as well. Now, let's look at tortoise, and by extension, golems in general. Golems are also not Celtic in origin. The golem comes instead from Jewish mysticism, where those who are divine or close to divine are able to shape humanoid creatures from mud and imbue them with life. Think low-tech, spiritually-powered robots made from dirt. The word golem itself comes from Hebrew and essentially just means unfinished human. If you're interested, go Google about the golem of Prague. This is likely why golems we see in Mobi are all made from some sort of rock, snow golems not included. In the game, Tortoise is key to the plot MacGuffins for Generation 2 and 3, as controlling it gives the user access to some sort of ancient knowledge. The name Tortoise just means gift or donation, presumably because the ability to control or create the creature is a gift from the gods, or maybe it's just a nod to the gift of knowledge. There's not a parallel I can find in any Celtic myth, so that's all I've really got on our big stony boy. The next thing we should talk about would be druids. Tarlock, Ezris, and a few other characters are all noted as druids, so what exactly are those, and what do they do? Most of our knowledge of druids comes from Julius Caesar, who encountered them during his campaigns in Gaul. From his accounts, druids functioned as priests, educators, and lawgivers. Caesar noted that their education was long, sometimes up to 20 years, and entirely preserved through oral tradition. Because of this, sadly, no certifiably ancient verses from their oral literature have been preserved even in translation. This is frustrating, because Gauls had a written language using Greek and later Roman script, they just never wrote anything down. Even more unfortunately, Druidic orders essentially went extinct once Christianity finally made its way to Wales, so any sources we could have asked about this would have been gone by the 6th or 7th century. Lastly, maybe most importantly, we should talk about the Tuatha Dé. I probably should have covered this in Generation 1, but I'm nothing if not head empty, so better late than never. The Tuatha Dé, we see in Aaron, are mortal, essentially just human beings, while the Milesians are these semi-divine beings who cannot die naturally. This dynamic is sort of the opposite of what it should be. The Tuatha Dé of real-world mythology were gods. Uh, think more of your Greek gods than Jesus or his dad. They lived in Ireland prior to the arrival of the Milesians, with an entire society and dramatics all to their own. Milesians eventually arrived and would conquer Ireland, forcing the Tuatha Dé Danann to retreat into the Shi. Shi translates literally to hill, but it shouldn't be taken literally. Shi, in this sense, were likely believed to be literal hollows inside of hills, but also entrances to the other world, from what I can tell. That's all you really need to know for Generation 2. A lot of this comes up again in 3, as it's a near direct continuation of the same story, unlike the jump between Gen 1 and 2. I initially planned to release the two videos together, 2 and 3 I mean, but that script ended up much longer than I expected, and while Generation 3 shares a lot of the same world inspirations as 1, it has much more going on in terms of game lore which I'm sort of looking forward to, even though I don't like Generation 3 itself very much. I'm considering on starting a series not too dissimilar from the format that I use here, covering the inspirations behind the details of the Witcher series, so if you're into that game, I hope you'll check it out. In the meantime, I'd really appreciate it if you do the YouTube things and like, comment, and subscribe to see my future content. Thank you for all your support as I continue working on building the channel.